Hello, uh, I'm Marguerite Josic. Uh, I've been working at Musée de la Musique for a year and a half now in Paris. Uh, all of you might know Sandy Lecomte, who was working there uh, before me. Uh, I arrived also at the same time as my colleague Sebastian Kirsch, who you also maybe know. Um, I'm an acoustician, and my background includes mechanics and acoustics uh, applied to musical instruments. Uh, it means that I'm pretty new in the cultural heritage community. Uh, actually, this is my first SimSim, -sim, and I'm very happy to be here, even uh, virtually. Uh, I'm going to share my presentation. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the vibrations and preservation project. Um, so it gathers many uh, partnerships that uh, I will present uh, in the next slides. Okay, so um, yeah, as we all study musical instruments, we all know that vibration is a very important topic for this kind of object uh, because historical musical instruments are surrounded by vibrations. Uh, first, when they are played, but also when they are transported inside and outside museums. Uh, the vibration has and preservation project was born because at uh, Musée de la Musique, we made two observations. The first is that curators and management staff often report damages on the instruments when they are transported. And the second was in that these events uh, seem to happen also in other museums. And the staff is often helpless when facing these questions. Uh, so this is how the project was born, and it deals with a very general question of how we can assess the impact of vibrations on cultural heritage objects and prevent these objects from the damages they could suffer from these vibratory resources. Uh, so I'm not going to talk much about uh, musical instruments today, because the uh, museum we work with uh, don't work with musical instruments all the time, but of course, all the work I'm going to present uh, can also be applied to these objects. So vibrations are present everywhere, both inside and outside museums, and they might be caused by different sources. For example, uh, the carts and trucks we used for the internal and external transportation of objects are uh, one of them. Some museums can also host some sound events like concerts, and during a concert, the vibrations can reach the objects through walls or the ground. A vibration can also happen because of the visitor steps in exhibition rooms or because of urban works uh, close to museums. Here is a quick example of what we can see at the Manchester Museum. Uh, you can see in the back a little black statue that turning around itself and if you look carefully, you can see that this phenomenon happens only during the day because of the vibrations of the visitors in the exhibition room. Um, in that case, I think no harmful consequences was uh, reported for the object. However, in some other cases, this kind of small displacement can lead to falling, uh, the falling of objects, which uh, of course can be a problem. Uh, so here's the summary of what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I'll give a short overview of the project and the partnerships. Then I'll, I will shortly resume the state of the art about how museum staff currently deal with vibrations in museum. And then I will present uh, the motivation of our project. Uh, this is also an ongoing project. So finally, I'm going to talk about the results of three case studies we conducted in the last year, because I want this talk to be like an overview of what we have been doing of this project so far, so that you can maybe give some feedbacks and um, this we can discuss together about what we could do in the future. Well, uh, this is an overview of the partnerships involved in the vibration and preservation project. Uh, our project is now at a national scale, and it is uh, uh, then led by the Institut National du Patrimoine. On the first hand, it gathers several scientific laboratories who are known to be specialists in vibration analysis. And on the other hand, uh, several museums, including curators and management staff in Paris, have joined uh, the project. 
the, the first discussions we had together uh, raised the fact that we needed to have a common vocabulary. And that's why we started the project with training sessions where people working in museum can learn more about the physics uh, of vibrations and people staff uh, from the labs learn how museum and management staff are organized and take care of the artworks. This dynamic exchange uh, between the numerous project partners and specialists helped to develop the first studies. And today scientific aspects and preservation needs move forward uh, hand in hand. During the training sessions, we recalled some of the basic physics of vibration and, and resonance. Maybe you already know them. We particularly um, focus on two concepts, which are um, the resonance frequencies, which are specific to each object. And the second concept is a resonance phenomenon, which occurs when the vibratory source contains one or several resonance frequencies of the object. In that case, uh, the object stores the energy of the source and begins to vibrate with a very high amplitude. And the phenomenon doesn't stop until the source stops. Resonance is a very important concept because in the worst case, uh, it can lead to damages like cracks, uh, breakage, loose mounting of elements, uh, etc. These damages can appear in a very short time, but they might also appear after a very long period of time, and this is called a vibration fatigue phenomenon. So now I'm going to talk about the state of the art, about how much uh, how museum staff deal with vibrations. Uh, the vibrations follow a path that can be th seen as a three different as three different parts. First, the source that creates the vibrational energy. Uh, then the vibrations go through a path including air, walls, ground. And finally, it reaches the object. So basically, if you want to mitigate vibrations, you have three solutions that show up. The first one is to monitor the power of the source so that the level of vibration is as small as possible. Uh, this situation has been faced uh, by the Walker Art Gallery of Liverpool when const where constrictions took place next to a painting and the wall on which the painting was, uh, was vibrating. So therefore, the, the only solution, the only conceivable solution was to constant, constantly monitor the vibration level thanks to data loggers in front of the, the wall. The second solution ad, adopted by museum is to filter out the vibrations before uh, it reaches the object. This solution has been followed by the Field Museum in Chicago, who experienced very high vibration levels in a hall where a Tyrosinoris rex skeleton was exposed. And um, this floor was very flexible. So it was vibrating very uh, much uh, because of the visitor's steps. So to stiffen the floor structure, uh, the museum added columns under the existing girders to prevent the floor from vibrating too much. And uh, finally, the third solution that, it often sh that is uh, often chosen by museum is to apply protections directly close to the object. These protections include foams uh, or passive dampers or boxes. And generally the solution is found after a two steps process, which is first to study the mechanical behavior of the, the object and then find find out how to cancel out the most harmful frequencies uh, for, these, for this object. These are a few examples of what we can find in the literature. Uh, but if you do a total state of the art about the way museums deal with vibrations, you can have uh, three conclusions. The first is that there is a lack about the baseline limits for allowable vibrations of cultural objects. Um, well, some people made some papers about it, but the scientific basis they rely on uh, are sometimes unclear. And more importantly, they often talk about amplitude limits without considering the signal frequency content. And this is a, this is a problem because of the resonance phenomenon I was talking about before. 
Also, we don't have much knowledge about how conditioning systems like foams, box, ex boxes, etc., affect the resonance frequencies of the objects. There are some examples in the literature that show that conditioning systems can sometimes make it worse because they create resonances uh, instead of reducing them. So this is a problem. And, uh, and finally, museums deal with a great diversity of objects and it makes very difficult uh, the design of a general and efficient solution, uh, of course. Uh, to address these issues, our project developed different research interests, uh, which are first uh, a better understanding of the vibration sources inside and outside museums. What frequency content do we have in them? What amplitudes, etc. We also want to develop tools for museums and laboratories to assess the impact of vibrations on cultural objects so that we can then establish vibrations limits and design proper protection systems to ensure that the object vibrations stay within the limits we, we previously defined. Okay, so now I'd like to present you three case studies we conducted both in laboratories, but also uh, on real objects. The first study uh, is a work that we conducted with the Musée du Louvre. Um, the Musée du Louvre began to move many artworks from Paris to Livin more than a year ago. Hundreds of round trips are planned. And we took advantage of this planning to put some sensors inside the truck and measure the acceleration of um, the packing system. Uh, so we put accelerometers on the truck's ground and on the packing system to, to understand how the whole object reacts to the ground vibrations. This is a first example with a, with a box, a big box. Uh, we found that, as you can see, the box doesn't move much above, above 130 hertz because uh, the box vibration is below the vibration of the truck's ground. It doesn't mean that the object inside the box doesn't vibrate, but still the box doesn't move much in that frequency range, so it's pretty good news. However, if, you, if we look at the vibrations under 130 hertz, we can see that the vibration of the ground and the box are almost equal, which means that the conditioning system follows the for movement of the road, which could be pretty bad uh, for the object inside. Here we have another example with another conditioning system and we can see the same phenomenon as before. We have uh, some frequency ranges where the vibration of the road are damped by the packing system, but we also have problems in some low frequency ranges. And at very low frequency around 20 or 30 Hertz, we even have a, a very clear resonance phenomenon uh, that could damage the object inside the box. So, um, this first work showed that conditioning systems can suffer from resonance phenomenon. Uh, we also uh, show that the majority of the energy of vibratory resources are below 1000 Hertz. And in, that, in this frequency range, a uh, conditioning system might not be always efficient uh, because of resonance phenomenon. Okay, so the second study I wanted to talk about is a recurrent question that French museums, management teams, and maybe others are facing. Uh, it's the impact of foams on the vibration projection of objects. Um, there are many types of foams used in the museum. Uh, the three main types are polyurethane, plastazote, and ethafoam. Some of them, like plastazote and ethafoam, are known to be chemically stable and can be used for storage as well as uh, transportation. But some of them, like polyurethane, are not chemically or physically stable, and they are used only for transportation. The polyurethane foam is even known to be efficient against vibrations. Uh, but we'll see in the next slide that we might need to temper uh, this affirmation. Uh, so what we did is we put a one kilogram mass on different foams, and we make them vibrate with an exciter that can simulate any vibration source signal. We recorded the source signal with a force sensor, and we also recorded the acceleration of the mass with an accelerometer. 
The goal of the experiment was to see how the one kilogram mass vibrates and if its vibrations change if we change the type of foam under it. So here is the one kilogram mass vibration response for two centimeters polyurethane foam in blue. In orange, we have a theoretical curve that shows how the, how the, how the mass would have, res would, uh, would have respond if there were no foam under it. The first remarkable thing that we can see is that there is a frequency range in which the behavior of the mass with and without foam is the same. So it means that in that frequency range, the foam is not efficient at all. Then we have another uh, resonance uh, sorry, another region between uh, 40 hertz and 200 hertz, where we can see a resonance created by the foam. Uh, previously, I was talking about the fact that sometimes conditioning systems can be worse than no conditioning at all. And here we have a very practical demonstration that foam can create resonance. And um, finally, we have the last frequency range above 200 hertz, where the foam is quite efficient because the blue curve is below the orange curve. If you change the type of foams and keep the same thickness, we can see that the behavior of the mass is quite the same. Even if we have slightly modifications of the frequencies at which the resonance happen or at which the foam is efficient, we still have a region where the foam is not efficient at all and a region where it is efficient. Uh, the behavior of the different types of foam were also tested in real museum conditions. Uh, at Musée du Louvre, uh, for example, the management team has to frequently move small Egyptian statues called uh, Ushapti um, on a very damaged road. And they were questioning the type of foam they should use for the transportation of these objects. So we conducted an experiment where we, when we put, where we put the shapti above different types of foams and different thicknesses also, and we measured how the shapti was responding to the road. And we found the same results suggested by the previous study. Under 100 Hertz, the foams are not efficient to reduce the vibration of the shapti, and um, uh, above 100, uh, the efficiency is okay. So that's it for the, the second study uh, on the foams. Uh, finally, I'd like to make a focus on the work in progress uh, that we started in March. Uh, this work investigates uh, the potentiality of resonant frequencies to monitor the degradation of cultural objects. Because uh, the tricky but also interesting part of resonant frequencies is that they might change if the object slightly changes. Uh, more specifically, they depend on three main characteristics, which are the object geometry, uh, the object mechanical properties, and they also depend on the way which the object is bound to its environment. So if an object is damaged, its mechanical properties like internal stress might change, and its resonant frequencies might change as well. So this is, these resonant frequencies might be a potential tool to monitor the change of geometry or internal stress inside the objects. And so they can, could monitor the damages suffered by these objects. The main idea of our experiment was to make, to take an object and make it vibrate with a very high amplitude in order to damage it. And we wanted to see if its resonance frequencies change over time. So what we do, what we did is we take, we took a painted wood piece that was used for conservation students training and we fixed it on a vibrating pot. And first we measured the resonance frequencies of the object at rest. Then with the help of the vibrating pot, we made the object vibrate at, at its first resonance frequency so that the object vibrates with a very high amplitude. And we made it vibrate during 30 minutes. Then we stopped the exciter. We made a report condition to see if any damages is observed. 
is observed. Then we measured its resonant frequencies again to see if they have changed. And we repeated the, the operations uh, six times. And after six vibration cycles, we let the object rest for two days and we measured again its resonance frequencies. So this is the resonance frequencies of the object uh, before the experiment. Each peak corresponds to a different resonance frequency. After 30 minutes of vibration, we can see that the frequency that the frequencies uh, don't change much. Same after one hour of vibrations and same after the third vibration cycle. During these cycles, no damage was reported on the object. However, after four vibration cycles, so two hours, we can see an additional resonance frequency showing up and an increase also of a resonance frequency around 1,500 Hz. And that phenomenon seems to increase after another vibration cycle. And we report uh, a small detachment of wood that fall down at this moment. After 30 more minutes, no other difference was observed and then the experiment stopped. So after that, we let the object rest for two days and we measured the resonance frequencies again. And what we found is that the frequencies went back to normal uh, as if the change of resonant frequencies was reversible. So for the moment, we have no clue about what really happened, but it seems that maybe the high vibration level led to a change of internal stress that could have led to the small detachment of wood that we've seen before. That just um, an hypothesis and um, the work is, is going on uh, right now. Okay, so as a conclusion, I just wanted to say that uh, our results are from case studies. So it means that they only apply to objects, to the objects we considered. If you change the object or the size of the phone, for example, you might have different results because the mechanical behavior, behavior will be different. However, all the work we did helps to understand the, vi the vibratory sources around cultural objects, especially our study, like many other studies, suggests that the majority of the energy of the vibratory sources are, is below 1000 Hertz. And the problem is that in that frequency range, conditioning system, especially foams, are not always efficient and resonances can happen. Uh, we also have an ongoing study about the vibrations inside the, the Musée de la Musique when we transport musical instruments. I don't have the results yet, but um, if you're interested, we can, of course, keep in touch. And finally, I just wanted to say that we obtained uh, a PhD grant until 2023 to develop a technical solution that could be applied to great diversity of objects. Uh, I can't tell you more about it because uh, it's secret for the moment. Um, but if you're interested to join the project, maybe we can talk about it later. Well, this is some bibliography I used uh, in my um, presentation. And I just want to thank you all for your attention. And thank, uh, I also thank my colleagues uh, working in this uh, big project. Thank you.